service did you serve in? I was in during Vietnam and I was an army nurse. What was your highest rank? Major. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I signed up. And I know we talked off camera. You went in as an officer? Yes, ma'am. And what your background was? I went in after five years of graduate experience. I had a bachelor's in nursing and I had been working for five years. So I went in as an officer. What was your rank when you entered? Captain. Where were you living at the time? San Francisco. Why did you join? I was looking for a better job, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, the hospital where I was working in San Francisco had found their niche for me and I wasn't happy with that. So I wanted something better. Why did you pick the Army? Therein lies a tale. Uh, I had made the decision to go military. I eliminated the Air Force because they would not give me the equivalent rank. Having grown up on the Jersey Shore, I loved the water, so I was thinking Navy. But I lost the Navy recruiter on the Bayshore Freeway on the way to Oak Knoll Hospital. She was driving a white car and she was a lane changer. And I followed the wrong white car off the wrong exit and said, in essence, the hell with this, I can find Letterman. So I joined the Army. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yes. Um, basic training, Fort Sam Houston. Where were you inducted? Right there in San Francisco? Yes, yes. The swearing-in took place at um, the Presidio of San Francisco. And then were you immediately sent for basic training? It was about a month, I think, from the time I raised my right hand to the time I actually went on active duty. So, for your basic training, they sent you to Fort Sam Houston in Texas? Yes, ma'am. And how long did that last? Basic at that time was two months, eight weeks. What was basic training like? It was a lot of drill and ceremony, and I was a platoon leader, and I'm kind of proud of my performance there because there were three platoons in our company and I could out shout and out maneuver the other platoon leaders. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that was right in basic. You started off like that. Oh, yes, ma'am. So what <laughs> kinds of things did they train you? Well, uh, there was a lot of this is the Army, this are the rules and regulations, uh, this is the forward edge of the battle area, and uh, this is how some of the maneuvers go. But there was also a lot of training in field sanitation, and I remember the goat lab where um, we were trained, even though we were nurses, we were trained to debreed wounds, and this involved first anesthetizing a goat, and then they would shoot them, and we would have to clean up the wounds. Wow. So, now, because you were already a nurse, you were already targeted to be in the medical? Uh, oh, absolutely. So I went directly into the nurse corps. Oh, so everybody that was in basic training with you were nurses? We were all nurses. Were they all experienced nurses? Did they come into the service no. with nursing background? This was a time, they were all graduate nurses. Some of them were fresh out of school. Uh, there was at that time the Army Student Nurse Program where the military would pay for their nursing education in return for their service 
upon graduation. Now, what year was this that you signed up? 1964. So you actually had, in addition to military training, you did have medical training? Yes. At Fort Sam Houston. Um, do you remember any of your instructors? Kitty Betts. Little ball of fire. <laughs> what did she teach? I think she was more an administrator. Um, she taught things like this is how the evaluation system works. Um, and she was in charge of the company. What were your duties as a platoon leader and why did they choose you to be a platoon leader? I was one of the few who came in as captain. Most of them were lieutenants. So the three of us who were chosen, or the two women who were chosen to, there were three platoons, two female and one male. And the two women were captains. The male who was chosen was a graduate of um, a military school, civilian, if, if that makes any sense. He went to a military high school um, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So he knew his drill and ceremonies. But by the end of it, I could outmaneuver him. So what were your duties as a civilian? Each morning we would have to uh, go into formation and I would have to lead them through the marching drills, um, march around the quad. I have a photo of that. Um, and it was just a matter of learning uh, parade duties, parade performance, and I would lead the troops. How many people were in your platoon? Approximately 30, 35. There were about 100 of us in the company. In, in three platoons. Now, did they segregate the men and the women? Did, you said that did they say what? Segregate the men platoon from the, the women? Only for marching. Oh, so all your training was integrated? Together. All the classes were co-ed. Um, and much of the social activity. So what other things can you tell me about your basic training? Um, I'm trying to think. Anything memorable from those two months? Yes, but not that I'm willing to share on camera. Do you think it was good training? Yes. Um, Yes. There was uh, nothing you'd like to share about basic? We did. Part of basic involved a, uh, I believe it was three day exercise in field uh, conditions. They took us out to a place called Camp Bullis. Spell that? Uh, B U L L I S. Where we set up a field hospital in tents. We did uh, practice with mass casualty, carting people around on stretchers, playing patient, playing nurse. Um, and it also involved an exercise in uh, map reading. And they took us out. This was in the woods, uh, north of San Antonio. And they took us out in groups of three with two compasses and a snake bite kit and told us to find our way home. They would drop us off. And most of us got back. There were one or two groups they had to send the chopper out to find. So there were just three, three people three, in one group? Three people in a group. So your group did OK? We were about the third or fourth group to come in. Did you have a graduation ceremony from basic? 
Not that I remember. So you just completed it? Where did you go after basic training? After basic, I was sent to Letterman General Hospital in San Francisco, the Presidio of San Francisco. That was part of the uh, enlistment agreement at that time. They called it Operation Nightingale because they were recruiting nurses and they were guaranteeing the first assignment. And I thought I had asked all the proper questions, but I left one out. What was that? For how long am I guaranteed this assignment? And within the year I was in Japan. So it was one year. Now, this was a civilian hospital or military hospital? Letterman General is one of the major military hospitals. What were your duties there? There I was assigned as a staff nurse on a general surgical ward. So what kind of cases did you usually have? We had plastic surgery. We had thoracic surgery. And we had miscellaneous other stuff. <laughs> and you were there for about a year? I was there for just under a year. And then you were sent to? Then I was sent to Japan. Camp, Camp Zama, Z-A-M-A. Do you know where that is in Japan? Just outside Tokyo. And what did you do there? There I was the education coordinator. Uh, in those days, this is in the 60s now, um, not very many nurses had bachelor's degrees. <clears throat> and because I did, the um, chief nurse assigned me as education coordinator. Today they're called staff development positions. <clears throat> and my job was to run continuing education programs for all levels, the uh, basic corpsman, the advanced training corpsman, and the nurses. Did you enjoy doing that? Very much so, because I had, my goal was to enter teaching anyhow. The chief nurse's eyebrows really hit the ceiling when she heard that because I didn't know what she had in mind for me. And when I said I wanted to teach eventually, she was... What was your impression of Japan? I loved it. I just loved it. Um, they say it takes six months to adapt to another culture. I adapted in four months and it took actually took me longer to readapt to the being back in the United States. I was very homesick for Japan when I got back. Wow. How long were you stationed at Camp Lama? Three years. Oh, wow. And did you live on the base or off base? I went off base as soon as I could. I have a philosophy of What's the point of being in another country if you're not going to live in that country? And which made me a little bit of an oddball, but uh, the chief nurse was very supportive. Now, how long was your enlistment period? When you signed up, how many years did you sign on for? Well, the Army is sneaky that way. I signed up under what it's called OBV, Obligation Voluntary, for two years. When the orders came through for Japan, chief nurse called me in and said, would you like to go to Japan? If so, sign here. And suddenly I was in a different category, voluntary indefinite. Because if I accepted the orders to Japan, I had to agree to stay the tour, which would put me over the two years. Okay. So they slipped me from one category into the next, and then into the next, which so, we will get there. All right, so now that puts you into more than your two years. It was that three years in Japan. Right. Then you were at the end of your tour then. What did you do? Uh, from Japan, I came back to Fort Sam Houston to what is called the advanced course. Advanced course in what? Um, military life. 
the basic training program is designed to prepare you to be a company grade officer. Okay. The advanced course is designed to prepare you to be a field grade officer. Now when you came back from Japan, were you still a captain? I was transitioning. I left Japan as a captain. I walked into Fort Sam as a major. Oh. So where did you get promoted? Was there any kind of ceremony or anything? No. No. I, I sort of skipped that. Okay. So it happened in route somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the orders came through, but nobody pinned the leaf on my shoulder. Okay, so you went into advanced training as a major. What did you do? What kind of things did you learn in advanced? Um, could we go back? Sure. Because we missed things in Japan. Oh, yeah. Well, tell me all the Japan <laughs> stuff first. Okay. Uh, I was in Japan in a 100-bed hospital when Nam blew. Oh, you were? Yeah. Well, what's the name of the hospital you were in? Um, Camp Sama. No, I'm sorry. That, that's it. Yeah, Army Medical Command, uh, Japan, I think it was. We were just the, the hospital for Kansoma, which was actually in the facility that had been the Japanese West Point. And we did have a little problem with the beds not fitting through the doors. Um, but I was there when Nam really blew. Did you see it coming? Did you know? We were already in Nam, of course. Uh, there was some activity, but the full extent of the war was not. I was. Did you realize that things were heating up and that you might soon be getting casualties from Vietnam? No. So, what was your first recollection that the, that the war was? When we suddenly had 800 patients. All from Vietnam? All from Vietnam. In how short a period? We moved up uh, a matter of weeks, three or four weeks. Can you they just started the coming in. the months around? It was, I went over in February and it was September or October. What year? 65? 64. 64, so it's still 64? Oh, no, wait a minute. No, it's 65, excuse me. So you had 800 patients when you only have a 100 bed unit? Mm hmm. So. And staff for 100. So uh, what was that like? That was long days, seven days a week. Uh, I suddenly became the admitting nurse basically um, they would fly in the patients we got the ones that you could patch up and send back back to vietnam back, back to back vietnam to yeah back to vietnam those who were not going back to the combat area went through the philippines and back to the states and <clears throat> we had patients all over the place we set up an 80 bed receiving unit in the gymnasium and that became my unit. And I'm out there directing buses and sorting them out and doing all sorts of things I never knew I had the capacity to do. And it was quite a time. There was uh, a great deal of camaraderie. Um, there was an awful lot of work. And I ended up working I was the, um, oh, what's the proper term, the hole plugger. Uh, if they needed a nurse somewhere, they sent me. So I ended up working on just about every unit in that hospital except the operating room itself. Did they do everything at that hospital? Yes. Um, the medical setup in Japan at the time I went over was that between the three services, Air Force, Army, and uh, Navy, that we covered all the specialties. Not each hospital had each specialty, but between the three of us, we did cover them. And 
of course, when we all blew up into great numbers, um, <coughs> then of course we got a variety of specialists in each area. What did your hospital specialize in originally? It was a general hospital. It was what's called a station hospital. Uh, we were there to meet the health care needs of the people assigned to that camp, that base. So, so we had a little maternity. Uh, we had general surgery, general medicine, dentistry. So when the war broke out and expanded, then you really, your specialty had to change drastically. Oh, very much so. I had been a maternity nurse when I joined the Army. <laughs> Here I am running orthopedic wars. Again, I have a picture of one of them. Um, and um, just doing whatever was needed. Can you describe what a typical, as much as you could describe a typical, what a typical day would be like for you? Trying to think of a typical day. Um, say I had a shift um, on one of the large wards, it would be me and about a hundred patients and two corpsmen, and that's it. And we gave damn good care. Um, a lot of medications. Uh, sometimes there were some young men who had had battlefield promotions and were at ranks beyond their years and thought they were hot stuff and bound and determined to take out those nurses because it was a big challenge for the enlisted folk to go after the officers. And this one young man just wouldn't give up. He was going to take me out for a steak dinner. And finally I told him how old I was. He didn't believe me. Because <laughs> I was 10 years older than he was. And so I showed him my ID card. <laughs> That's the last I heard from him. <laughs> Do you remember any specific cases while you were in Japan? I remember one incident in particular. Um, of a young man who had taken a massive abdominal wound in Nam and was headed back to the States but destabilized on the flight and was pulled off <clears throat> and sent down to us and we had to uh, do special duty with him one one on one <coughs> uh, because he was he had six or seven tubes coming out of his body and each one output had to be measured and this sort of thing. And one of the problems that he developed was a stress ulcer, which led to bloody diarrhea. And for those of you who are not in the medical field, it reeks to high heaven. So here I am, <clears throat> after having spent um, by then over a year training the corpsman and suddenly I'm doing private duty on this patient and I'm running down the hall with a bedpan held out at arm's length because of the aroma. <clears throat> and one of my prize students said, gee, Captain Marshall, I didn't know you knew how to take care of patients. So they learned something about you. They just thought you were a teacher? <laughs> I don't know what they thought at that point. <laughs> ah. So did you stabilize that young man in the new home? Yes, we did eventually. Uh, the military brought his family over and they were able to be with him until we got him stabilized and got him back to the States. How did you manage the care when you were so short-staffed? Um, <sighs> There are a lot of things you can do in the military that you can't do in civilian life. And you can recruit um, able-minded customers, if not necessarily able-bodied, from among the patients. 
One of the other situations in the military is that there's no place in the system for someone who is convalescing. So they stay in a separate unit um, in the medical area until they're fully able to resume duty, active duty. And we use them for messengers, uh, to run lab work here and there, to transport patients. Um, you simply employ whoever you can get your hands on who is capable of doing what needs to be done. And these things you can't do in, in civilian life. As the war escalated, did you get more help at the hospital? Yes. That's one thing that impressed me a great deal. Uh, every fall, uh, Lenny, we called him, <clears throat> who was the Surgeon General, would come through the area in November on what we dubbed his annual Christmas shopping tour. <laughs> <laughs> and he took one look at the place and the situation there, and within two weeks, help started coming. And till we had almost more help than patients for a while. I mean, they really sent us, they moved so fast. So he came through in November, so it was probably November of 65 65, 65 65 yes but you still only had 100 beds how did you accommodate all the patients? oh uh, the military set up for this and we got them out of storage there was a depot up the road and these beds had been put in storage in world war ii during the occupation and they came out of storage and we used all sorts of spaces um, as I said, it, it had been the hospital for the Japanese West Point. Uh, there were wards that we were not using until this happened. We put 80 beds in the gymnasium. Uh, we found space. Are there any other memorable experiences you have from your time in Japan? <sighs> I did a lot of Space A travel around the area. Um, I saw so much of Asia while I was there, when I would, was able to get leave, uh, into Thailand, into India, the Philippines, Taiwan, Korea, South Korea. Um, and that just started the wanderlust. Ah. Uh, okay. Um, and there were just, there were so many experiences. Um, when the troops were in the convalescent phase and they would get passes, sometimes it would be, the nurses were the permanent party. So we were there, we knew our way around, we had cars. So we were very popular. And many of the time, I would go into Tokyo on a date with five or six guys. <laughs> the convalescing patients. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in touch with any of your patients? No. So once you patched them up and sent them back, you never knew what happened to any of them? No. Did you ever get a patient back again? I don't remember any that came back. So, what? Well, so then your, would you say the highlight of your career was during, was that your period during the Vietnam War that, that you were in Japan? The war was must have still been going on when you came back home to the United States. It was. It was. Um, it in the we pulled out. I came back in January. Of what year? Of, no, wait a minute. I came back in November of 67. Then I went to the advanced course, which was six months. And then I went to long-term civilian schooling. And where was that? 
uh, you didn't go back to Japan again once you came no. for three years in Japan, you came back to the United States. I came back to the States. I went to Fort Sam Houston for the six month advance course. Um, and then I was selected for long term civilian schooling. Translation, they sent me to Yale for two years to get my master's in midwifery. For the military. For the military. Do you have any choice in anything that they train you for? Does the military just tell you what you're going to do? I applied for that specific program, and uh, you can always ask. You don't always get. <laughs> so you were but then a major. Yes. You applied for the two-year degree program mm -hmm. at Yale. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that fall that, um, wait a minute. No, I'm mixing things up. Um, I'm mixing up the Pueblo incident that happened around Thanksgiving of my first year there. But we pulled. Yale? Yes. Um, do you remember the Pueblo? I do. Um, and I remember discussing that. I was the first military nurse to hit the Yale School of Nursing. <laughs> they, really? They didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> It took me a year to convince them that I was Army, not Air Force. And then the next year, the Air Force sent a nurse to just really confuse everybody. <laughs> so you were the first military nurse there? So where did you stay? There was no base at Yale. No. Um, I had my housing allowance, and I bought a house in Hamden. So basically, you, you lived as a civilian? I lived as a civilian. My job was to go to school. They paid all the bills and I drew my full salary. So you went to school at Yale for two years and learned midwifery? Mm -hmm. And it was during that time that the Pueblo incident occurred. So right. What happened? How were you involved with that? No, it's just I remember talking about that with my colleagues um, over Thanksgiving that year. How did the civilians? Now that you're at Yale, treat you knowing that you uh, were military and in fact had, had served in the Vietnam War. Um, this was a very interesting time because this was also the time that William Sloan Coffin, who was an anti-war activist, was the uh, at the Yale Divinity School, and there was a major demonstration at uh, on the green and. New Haven uh, anti-war demonstration um, and it just amazed me I had no problem my colleagues treated me well um, and on a few occasions I even had to show up in uniform for one reason or another um, so I was I had friends I was just one of the group um, but when they were preparing for this mass rally, um, if they had known that their plans for the first aid stations and how to handle the casualties and all of this, if they had known how they were paralleling the military structure, they would have died. <laughs> I didn't uh, point that out to them. <clears throat> Any memorable experiences from your time at Yale? Hmm. Well, my first birth. Um, poor soul was a chronic schizophrenic. And I had cared for her in the prenatal clinic. And she happened to be my customer. Uh, when I was rotating through labor and delivery and she came into the hospital we asked her um, you know, why you're here well I live on the third floor okay and at that time Yale had a four-hour hold policy where you could bring a patient in and observe them for four hours without having to admit them. 
So we put her in bed. She turned over and went to sleep. Four hours later, I go back to evaluate her for discharge. She had a contraction, pretty good one. So I waited. Five minutes later, she had another one. Oh, I better tell my instructor. So I go and get the instructor. And we get the. Um, she waits. Five minutes later, she has a third contraction that we knew about. And since this was not her first child, the instructor says, well, if we're going to medicate her, we better do it now. So she goes down to get the medicine. I stay with the patient. And when she comes back, I'm holding the child in my hands. Oh. <laughs> she just spit it out. So that was your That birth? was my first official birth. Wow. How many other births did you either assist or, or witness while you were there? Oh. Um, we were, the aim was to have 20 as a student, okay, okay uh, that we could count as our own. We followed many labors that unfortunately didn't deliver on our shift kind of thing. Um, overall in my career I've delivered some 500 babies. Oh, good Lord. Cool. Do you remember all of them? No, there are other some that stand out more than others. Uh, were those all in the military? About two hundred of them were military. The other th uh, three were after I left active duty. Yeah. Now you're doing drastically different <laughs> nursing between Japan mm -hmm. and your mid. Which did you prefer? Um, how was it different? Which, did you like one better than the other? Well, midwif midwifery was my intended career, um, but each assignment had its own pros and cons, and certainly I would not trade my time in Japan for anything, and I'm grateful for my military, my midwifery career that I got compliments of the Army. Um, I like variety. So you really enjoy all the different types of nursing that you did? Yes, I do. All right, after your two years at Yale, where did you go? Then I went to Madigan General Hospital, Fort Lewis, Washington. Madigan? Mm-hmm, M-A-D-I-G-A-N. That's the state of Washington? Mm-hmm. And what did you do there? There I was the head nurse on the maternity unit. And how long were you there? Two years. Were you in the maternity unit for the entire time? Almost. Um, they had us doing a rotation as evening and night supervisor, so I did three months of that. And what were your duties like and your life like in Washington? So what year do you think this is? This is 70 to 72. I'm sure this was a, another different experience. What was it like there? Uh, yes, it was a very different experience. The first of all, Washington is gorgeous. Beautiful, green, tall, humongous trees. What part of Washington is it located? Here? Tacoma. That's on the west. It's on Puget Sound, south of Seattle. Gorgeous country out there. Mount Rainier. Um, I think the highlight, or one of the more memorable cases that I had there was a young woman who was an Air Force uh, nurse who got pregnant in Nam. And at that time, 
the military policy had been within two weeks of your diagnosis of pregnancy, you're out on your ear. <coughs> this young woman said, no, you don't. I want my job. Uh, she had made arrangements for adoption of the child, and she wanted to keep her job. And the ACLU got hold of her, and she became the test case that forced the military to change their policy on pregnancy in their female uh, members. And I cared for her, I specialed her in labor, and because she had nothing but the BOQ to go to, I took her and her baby to my home after she delivered until she was able to fly to where she uh, gave the child up to the what adoptive the parents. Bachelor officer's quarters. So how long did you have her at your house? It was about a week. And the baby too? And the baby too. So mm -hmm. you were probably doing some nursing at home too? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then she went... Uh, she took the child to wherever the adoptive parents were and <clears throat> she kept her job and of course they sent her to one of the first assignments they could find for her. They sent her to Minot, South Dakota or North Dakota which is you know frozen in most of the year. Wow well that was historic. <clears throat> it was. Did you stay in touch with her? No. Any other interesting incidents while you were in Washington? No. After your two years in Washington, <clears throat> by now you're, you know, you keep extending your stay in the military. Had you decided at this point to make it your career? Okay. Missed that step. Uh, when I applied for long-term civilian schooling, the caveat was, you want this, you go regular army. Oh. Okay. Well, so, so now you have become the regular army, and how many more years did that add to your commitment? Uh, going regular army just meant you were telling them you'd stay. Uh, there was no specific commitment to that. Accepting long-term civilian schooling entailed a commitment of two years of service for each, each year of education. <clears throat> you intended to make military your long By then, career? yes. By then, yes. So I guess you liked it. Yes. After Washington, where did you go? I was sent down to uh, <clears throat> William Beaumont at Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso, to set up a nurse practitioner program in OBGYN for the Army. Have they had anything there before that? No. No, this was one of two programs that they set up for OBGYN. And I had the one. And, and how I long set did that you up. stay there? I was there 18 months when I came up on orders for Germany. While you were there, what did you do to set that up and what were your duties like? I had to, um, I had an outline, a notebook that said there will be so many hours of this, 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 and this in the curriculum. And I had to write the lesson plans and take the people who were sent to me and train them. So by the time you left, 18 months later, did you have a uh, nurse practitioner program in place? Yes. Yes. Any memorable experiences from, from that time? No, not that I would be willing to share. So then you received orders to go to Germany? Mm hmm And I went to uh, the hospital at Bad Cannstatt and that is spelled B-A-D-C-A-N-S-T-A-T. 
T. And that, yeah, one A by Konstadt. And where was that in Germany? That's in Stuttgart, Germany. And I was the head nurse of all of the uh, obstetric area. What year was this? This was 72, the end of 72, I think it was November. Yeah, it was then November you when I went over. Madigan, Washington. From 70 to 72. Then you went to Oh, no, wait a minute, excuse me. 74. Months, so it had to be. So we're, we're in 74 now. Okay. End of 74, 75, 76. And I got extended three months. So I came home in February of 77. I came back to the States. So you went to Germany for three years? I went for two and was extended by three months. Uh -huh. They extend your tours from time to time. So you were the head nurse for the OB-GYN mm -hmm. unit? Mm -hmm. And that was already existing? You didn't have to set that no, up? No, I didn't set that up. That so was what there. was life like in Germany? Compared to all your other places. <laughs> now you've been around, you have a lot of bases to compare. Yes. And Germany was interesting. But it was too much like home. Oh. Having been in Japan, and people looked at me like I was crazy when I say that, but um, much of our culture comes from Europe and Germany and that whole area. So it wasn't different enough for me. Although I did, as in Japan, I studied the language. Uh, University of Maryland has overseas extension courses and I have 12 units of Japanese and 12 units of German on my uh, transcript as well. <laughs> well. Anything memorable from your years in Germany? Colonel, um, early in my <laughs> stay over there, you know, this gentleman come in, and uh, the army, of course, has lots of rules, and it was husbands only, fathers only. Uh, and this gentleman comes in, it looks like a grandfather, and I have to say, you know, but uh, I'm sorry, only the fathers. I am the father. Oh. So you let him in. Oh, I let him in. <coughs> they got such a kick out of it. They actually gave me a little book of, uh, on Germany. <laughs> a little thank you. Uh, and then you came back to the United States in February of 77? Yes. And where did you go then? I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where finally, eight years after the Army trained me, they let me practice as a midwife. Oh, so nice. And that's where I delivered some 200 wow. army babies. And how long did you stay? You must have been there for a while to deliver that many uh, That was, again, uh, 77, 78, two years, not, not quite two years. And did you enjoy it that now you're finally getting to do what you wanted? Oh, it was incredible. 200 births, and those were all military mm -hmm. women? Mm -hmm. No, they're wives of military. Okay. Were they all just wives of military, or were, there, were any of Some them? were military women as well. But they didn't like to come to the midwives. Oh. Because the midwives wouldn't let them get away with this I'm pregnant, I need special duty drill. Especially since some of the midwives were pregnant themselves. And still working. And still working. Uh -huh. After that two year, Okay, I left active duty uh, 
from that point on. What does that mean? You left active duty, but are you still in the Army? Okay. Uh, there's a phenomena called uh, reduction in force. RIF. I was RIFed. Um, when there's a drawdown, NOM was over by then. They didn't need all these bodies anymore. And so they look for um, ways of cutting the size of the military. And in my case, they looked back to my first uh, OER, which is Officer Evaluation Report, and found that I had a low mark intact. And so I didn't get promoted. So that was the end of my active duty career. What year was that? 78? That was 78. So um, the day I was discharged from the active army, I joined the reserves. And I spent eight years in the individual ready reserve, the IRR. Uh, to complete that so that I could retire as a full military retiree. So after the eight years you had put in, how many years with the United How many years total with the United total States Army? Total 22 years. And then you were officially retired? And I, what year did you retire in? 86. Right. I'm going to ask you some questions about um, family life and living conditions. Okay. In all those places you went, you can kind of compare. Um, how did you stay in touch with family? And that would be more like when you were overseas. Um, I don't have family. So you didn't stay in touch with anyone back home? Well, actually, your home became, you went to so many Your home becomes the Army. And your home is wherever you are. So even though you, and actually you didn't start in Connecticut. The Connecticut is where you ended up. Yes. Um, what was the food like? How's Army food? For the most part, didn't eat in the Army mess halls. <laughs> well, you As an officer, um, I could have my own quarters. So I had my own living arrangement. I shopped at the uh, commissary, and I did my own cooking. Did you always have enough supplies, things you needed, medical things, um, especially when you were over in Japan? Yes, I don't remember any shortages there. We did have a bit of a supply problem with food uh, when the buildup first took place. But that soon got straightened out. It's like you couldn't have seconds in the mess hall. <laughs> Did you feel any pressure or stress on the job? Oh, good God, yes. What was that like, and how did you handle it? <sighs> what was it like? Um. I felt a lot of stress, not only from the workload, but from the fact that once again I fell between the cracks in that um, when I joined, most of the Army Nurse Corps were either what I then called old war horse majors left over from World War II and Korea and the young second lieutenants fresh out of the student nurse programs. And I came in as a captain. I fell in the middle. I didn't want to bother with the majors and the lieutenants didn't want to bother with me. So in many ways I was isolated and that had its stresses obviously. Um, how did I deal with it? Sometimes I, I would go in um, cycles, I guess is the way to put it. Um, sometimes I would 
spend a lot of time in the club socializing um, other times I would just keep to myself and my own um, resources reading and shopping I love to travel I did a lot of travel by myself um, I learned the language I was not afraid to go out on the economy and wander around and get lost and find my way home whereas other people and this has always distressed me if they learn to say please and thank you in Japanese they thought they were uh, had crossed the cultural divide and they could not understand my need to live on the economy to learn about the culture to travel their idea of being there and traveling was touring the various PX's well you got much fuller experience of each place you were yes. stationed yes what did people do for entertainment what did you do for entertainment um, first on the basis on, uh, at home in the United States and then when you were overseas well, when you're stateside, pretty much it's a civilian lifestyle. Um, there are certain activities that you are expected to attend, such as um, the high buy parties, the monthly um, hail and farewell gatherings at the officers' club. Uh, that it's pretty much de rigueur that you show up for where you greet the ones who have come in during the past month and say goodbye to those who are leaving um, other than that most of the activities were just whatever you chose to do off post um, overseas was particularly in Japan during the uh, conflict it was your social life was centered around the post and military posts are their own little towns in many ways primarily the, the club um, and they had enlisted clubs and officers clubs and you'd go there they'd have you could eat you could drink drinks and happy hour mixed drinks were 15 cents um, wow. <laughs> 25 cents regular price um, at slot machines and they'd have parties and all right there on base all right there on base you always went to the officers club because you were an officer yes um, once a year they'd have bosses night at the enlisted club which I enjoyed going to because they had a penny slot machine I like that one. You can get a lot of entertainment for a buck. <laughs> Did you have any USO shows or anything like that? Not while I was there. I was a little annoyed with Bob Hope about that. Because <laughs> he came later. <laughs> oh, so you missed out? So I missed him. Did you have leave while you were overseas? Oh, yes. Yes and I would travel that's when I would you go up to the air base you sign up on the list for space available uh, travel and um, you catch a hop on whatever plane is going wherever you want to go and I went to ah, Thailand I went to India the Philippines South Korea, Taiwan, <clears throat> and one time en route to, I think this was en route to India, um, the plane stopped at Tan Sanut in Vietnam. And I was only allowed to stand in the doorway and look out. They wouldn't let me off the plane. <laughs> So my actual in-country time in Vietnam was half an hour on the ground. You didn't get to see much. No, I didn't get to see much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you did 
get a lot of traveling. Typically, how, how long would your leave be? Usually two weeks. And you travel a lot? That yes. Going a lot yes, I did. And mm -hmm. you were afraid to do that? No. No. And Interesting. Because of your service, actually, you also get to travel a lot in the United States. So you've seen a lot, both in the country here and, and overseas. Yes, yes. I've actually been in 48 of the 50 states and 35 or 40 countries altogether. Oh, my heavens. Can you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events at any of your stops? <laughs> okay. Um, I was headed for Thailand and caught a flight from Tachikawa, which is the Air Force Base in Japan, um, down to Okinawa, which is where I would have to catch the plane into Thailand. And we got in at like three o'clock in the morning, went to find a, a room to stay in, and the base hotel, at that point, they were uh, double rooms and I saw on the board behind the desk that the room they assigned me to had one person already in it. I thought, oh, she's going to really appreciate me coming in at three in the morning. So did he. It was not <laughs> unoccupied. It took me three different rooms before I finally found one that was not occupied. Wow, and at 3 a.m. At 3 a.m. Uh, so <laughs> it was no surprise the next morning about 10 o'clock when I finally woke up when I heard a key in the lock and in walks the flight crew and I'm still in bed clutching the sheet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> They need a little more organization there. They, you know, they sort of looked at each other as if we heard the service was good, but this good? <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably have to go through what you go through, just keep trying the room to find one. <laughs> the one that you like. Yeah, so people say, you know, you travel alone? Aren't you lonely? I knew half the base in 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um. Now, as an officer, mm -hmm. um, what was your relationship with the uh, enlisted men, um, and what was your opinion of officers and the enlisted men? Well, the Army isn't as uptight as some of the other services about the relationships. Um, I think it was more that the enlisted had problems uh, and were less comfortable with us than the other way around because there would be comments about uh, know, who does she think she is she's you know she may be an officer but she's not that pretty and you know uh, so there were um, ego issues shall we say I was always pretty comfortable um, chatting with them, dating them on occasion. Um, they were the most of the, the bodies around were enlisted, you know. Um, and sometimes the enlisted say, well, you know, um, why won't you date me? Well, have you been to college? Can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? We have nothing in common, you know. So, um, but working with them was fine. What was your opinion of their fellow officers? There's good and there's bad. Um, 
I had some total losers. Some that were just being carried along. We had problems with the alcoholics. Um, some of them I was embarrassed to be a fellow officer with. Others were very fine people. Did you form any close friendships with either officers or enlisted? With some of the, my fellow officers, yes. Did you stay uh, in touch? With a couple of them. Are you still in touch with any today? Unfortunately, they're not alive. So no, there's no ex-military on my Christmas card list. Did you keep a personal diary? No. Now, when you went from active duty into the reserves, mm -hmm. what were your actual duties? Did you still have to show up anywhere, do nursing in a, at a base anywhere, go to uh, drills? Uh... Okay, the I was not in a unit that would have involved drills and uh, the two weeks of active duty in the summer kind of thing. I was in what's called the Individual Ready Reserve. I had to maintain a certain number of points per year to maintain my status in the reserve. Those points could be obtained in a variety of ways. Actually getting some active duty time, which I did one year. Uh, I spent a month at Fort Hood in Texas. Um, taking correspondence courses would earn you points. Um, attending professional conferences would count. Each day would count as a point. And you needed um, Is it 60 points? I forget the point total. Anyhow, each point was a day, and that eventually added up. And after I had completed eight good years, they said, okay, you are now officially retired. Do you remember your last day in service? <laughs> in, no. Do you remember your uh, no, because kind it came, of anticlimactic? Do you remember well, your last day of active duty service? Oh, yes. What was that like? Painful. Really? Very painful. You didn't want to leave? No. No. Very difficult. I had made my career decision, and it was taken from me. What did you do after you left the service? And now, even though you're accumulating your points mm -hmm. and you're on reserve, um, you're basically a civilian and can mm -hmm. come and go as you please. What mm -hmm. did you do for a career then? Okay, it took me a little time to get organized. Um, and then I applied. Fortunately, when I left active duty in uh, Kentucky, I had a neighbor who was active in uh, Veterans Affairs, and he said, the day you're discharged, take your health records, hand carry them to the VA, and apply for disability. Because even if it comes back zero, you have established service connection. And I took his advice. And he told me about uh, the educational benefits, and I applied and um, was rated at that point 40% disabled for um, things that the body had deteriorated while I was on active duty. Um, and I applied for vocational rehabilitation, which is different than the GI Bill. And I went to Harvard and got a doctorate in public health. How is uh, vocational rehabilitation different than the GI Bill? 
The GI Bill gives you a monthly stipend. Vocational rehabilitation pays all educational expenses, provides full health care including dental, and gives you a, small, a smaller monthly stipend. So I went to Harvard for seven years and I came out with a doctorate, no money in the bank, and no debt. Wow, and another degree. And another degree. So what was your intention then to? To teach. Uh, to teach? Yes. Did you go on to teach? Yes, I came back to Yale, and I was a professor at Yale. For how long? Six years. What did you teach? Midwifery. Ah, you're all Yes. And then what did you do? Because I know you're not doing that now. No. Uh, I burned out in academia. Yale is a tough setting. Um, I worked for Planned Parenthood for a couple of years, set up a prenatal care program for them in Bridgeport which is still going. And then I went to the University of Rhode Island For what? where I set up a new master's program in nurse midwifery. Got that program up, running, and accredited. Then got an offer from the University of Kentucky that I couldn't refuse. And I went there for a one-year assignment to close their program. So you really went full circle. Mm -hmm. Kentucky to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. After after your one year in Kentucky, where did you go? I came back here. I had kept this house uh, the whole time that I was moving around there, and I came back here and I went on unemployment while I figured out what to do. And what I eventually ended up doing was I slipped into retirement. <laughs> it snuck that. up on me. <laughs> wow. And I know you're back in school again. Well, before saying? that, I took up stained glass, went into the supply shop in Shelton uh, one day for some supplies, and walked out with a job and I worked for two years in the studio. And, then what and that led me into the courses at Housatonic. That's how I got into art. And last year, I responded to an article in the paper about a need for school nurses in Fairfield and I do a little bit of substitute school nursing, which is a whole other new field for me. Not, the, not any of the kind of nursing you've done in the past. No, is not at all. Elementary or high school level? As a sub, I go everywhere. Oh. <laughs> and I, had, I plan to retire from that in December. Wow. Did you join any veterans organizations? As a direct result of being a substitute school teacher last year uh, in Fairfield on Veterans Day, some veterans showed up for the school program and I went up and said, I'm a veteran too. And next thing I know, I get a phone call. You have been approved for membership in the American Legion. So did you join? So I joined. So, you're a member so of now American I'm a member of American Legion in Fairfield, in Fairfield post-143. Um, what kinds of activities do you do with that post? <laughs> well, um, they show the flag basically at a variety of civic functions. I have marched in the Memorial Day Parade. Uh, they do have a funeral detail where they come to the funerals of various veterans, which I have not participated in. Um, 
we had our annual picnic on Sunday and I still have leftovers in the refrigerator um, and the Shelton Post is bringing the moving wall to Shelton next month and I attended a meeting last night where I volunteered as a guide and computer search person for the wall while it will be in Shelton. Oh, and we did a um, care package for the Connecticut troops in Afghanistan. And a post in Stamford is sponsoring, um, I forget what they call it, but the care packages. Once a month, they go down to Walter Reed and Bethesda with greetings and gift certificates to the newly returned veterans so they can shop in the PX and get whatever they need. Nice. And I will be, I signed up for that. I haven't gone yet, but I will do that. How did your military service affect your life? I wouldn't be where I am without it. It has given me so much. Um, I have literally traveled the world I live in this very nice house in Trumbull, which is a nice part of Connecticut. I have my education, two masters and a doctorate, compliments of my military service. Uh, basically, I'm me because of what I did in the military. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Not while I was in it. It took the distance of being away from it to begin to see the politics. And looking back, I would feel differently now. Uh, than what I did. I was proud of my service and I'm still proud of my service. Um, I wish I could say I was proud of my country right now. How would you compare nursing? Because you've now done all kinds of nursing mm -hmm. in all different hospitals in all different situations mm -hmm. um, and how would you compare the nursing in the civilian world as compared to nursing in the military world? The civilian world is in many ways more restrictive. When you walk into a civilian hospital you know you're in a place where there are sick people and you don't have that atmosphere in the military hospital. Um, the patients have more freedom in the military. You're not worried about being sued in the military. Certainly the military midwives have led the way in the field of midwifery in getting prescriptive privileges, in getting hospital privileges, in having full scope midwifery practice long before the civilian world was able to achieve that. Um, there's so many opportunities in the military that um, are more difficult in the civilian world. Over your years in both civilian and military nursing, how have you seen nursing change? Oh wow. Uh, it has changed so much that I'm not sure I would go into nursing now because with the advent of um, managed care, which is actually managed cost medicine, you're not looking at the patient and what the patient needs. You're looking at how you can get it done as cheap as possible and get them out of your hair. And then there is the age shift, and geriatrics is not my field. 
even though I will be depending on them at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't covered yet? Any other stories, incidents, things that you can remember that I haven't asked you about? Oh, golly. I mean, we're talking a major portion of my life. Um, I think that covers what I am comfortable sharing. Well, Vanessa, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and for the opportunity to interview you. You're more than welcome.